this is something I've always wanted to ask Perry Hensel. Um, what possessed you to make a movie like the How Do They Come? Well, I wanted to make a movie. I'd been making commercials for 10 years. I'd always uh, thought of the company that I was making commercial that I'd formed, you know, to make commercials. And I always thought that it would get big enough one day to enable me to make a feature. And, um, you know, how did they come with that feature? So it was a takeoff. I mean, I was def a takeoff point in my, in my life as a writer and director. And I wanted to, to shift out of commercials. Now, the particular script, the how did they come? Was the, the, the Ragging story interest you from a long time, or it was just a, something that would give you a possibility of opening up all the different layers in Jamaican society? It came to me very suddenly. Um, one day, somebody was talking about Ragging, and everybody around said, that sound, you know, that's a great idea. First of all, it was a, it was a one, the first in a cycle of three stories that I set out to write. The first one was to do with the city. The second one was to do with the countryside. And the third one was to do with the struggle between the spirit of the city and the spirit of the countryside for control of the island. And How Do They Come was the first of those three stories and it was to explore the city through the eyes of a country boy and um, so within that general framework I was looking for a story and uh, when I heard about Rygin and when I saw the reaction that everybody had to the story of Rygin uh, it just grew and grew until um, I started to research him his, his life and then once I started, once started thinking about casting, um, it seemed that if you updated it and brought it to uh, up into the 70s, it would um, still be an you know, even more exciting story. And so that's the way it developed, really. I remember one day I was in Miami airport. And um, in this huge concourse with every possible kind of Latin American and American influence. Uh, I saw three young dreads walking along the, um, the concourse. And uh, I thought to myself, my God, you know, in this situation, Jamaica has a real presence. Those young kids are not uh, looking out here in the big wide world to pick up something. They're moving as those people are going to pick up something from them. It made a very strong impression on me. And the music came in as a, a bonus to the update on the story, where, um, you know, started to use Jimmy's experience as a singer and so on. And I'm, a, I'm a great believer in making a, making a fusion between um, anybody you cast and the role they're playing. I want, I would, I like to feel that they know more about it than I do, really. And that was the way into it with Jimmy, you know, to use his experiences in Kingston, to use him as a singer who had come out of West Kingston. Um, and the music just grew and grew from that once we cast him, really. Ragin, of course, was a, a criminal. Um, uh, probably the most famous criminal in Jamaica's history. And uh, everybody's reaction was, oh, I knew him. <laughs> or I knew his uncle. Or, I didn't, I don't, you know, it seemed like one out of every three people you ever talked to knew him somewhere along the line. Um, and, you know, by the, uh, I don't think anybody saw him as a folk hero as much as, you know, the film makes out. Um, he was just seen as a guy that created a lot of excitement and was memorable. And also had a sense of humor because he kept writing these notes and sending, you know, messages to the radio station and pictures to the gleaner and all that kind of thing. So he was a character. People recognize that. In fact, I heard that the initial name for the Harder They Come was in fact not the Harder They Come. What were the ones who worked They were free. They were free. I think we started off with Hard Road to Travel. Um, uh, what was the other one? 
But how did they come? Didn't come till right at the end because uh, Jimmy didn't write the tune. I would say till quite late in the uh, in the shooting. Certainly, well after the shooting had started. So we had a different name, you know. If I had to do it all over again, I think you can get it if you really want. Is what I would have called it. Why? Because of the song, or either? Um, I think it. I don't know. It just rings better to me now than how do they go. You see, there are two spirits in Jamaica, and I think there are two spirits most places in the world. There is the country spirit and the, and the city spirit. And the question is, um, which one is going to, which one is going to rule? Which one is going to be dominant? Philosophically, I really do believe in the spiritual world. I really do believe that, uh, that spirits have power. And I believe that people derive their power, particularly artists, from to the degree that they give themselves over to that spirit. I mean, a musician is an obvious example. A musician has power to the degree that he transmits music that touches people emotionally, uh, and so on and so forth. First of all, where does power, what classes of power are there? There are two, in my, and I came to the conclusion, there are two classes of power. There's the power that you can generate, and there's the power that you can transmit. No matter how great you are, the power that you can generate as a man or a woman is finite. If you, on the other hand, transmit energy, transmit power of something bigger than your personality, bigger than your ego, you would then become a transmitter of that power. Your power, the power you can transmit is theoretically infinite. And the degree to which you can transmit power is the degree to which your transmission system, your mind and your body, is free of ego. Because it's ego that clogs the filters. Right? If you consider that the African spirit was brought to the New World, and almost everywhere that spirit was beaten to death, or severely brutalized. Um, but that in Jamaica, there was a group of people, a group of Africans, who barely off the ship escaped up into the hills. Never gave up, never had their spirit beaten to death. Um, fought back to maintain their independence. Uh, and kept alive a spiritual energy that was not ever compromised. That's another hell of a story. And who is coming out? How thin a thread? I, I'm a Huguenot. And my people were slaughtered three times. You know what I mean? They tried to wipe them out. And um, in terms of ancestral spirit, one thinks of how thin a, f a thread can, can ancestral spirit hang on that it isn't broken. And when you consider that, that that African spirit took root in the Jamaican hills and produced the one man who said, look, hey, come on, 20 million black people in the West, we're joking. We have Africa to go and reclaim. Um, the people who are in Africa you know, uh, are just mashing it down. Um, why are we thinking about anything other than our base? Why don't we go back and reclaim it? Uh, I think the whole thing ties together in the most fascinating way.